Hello, everyone. Oh, that's kind of loud, huh? Hi, guys. I'm Jordan Gutman. I am the general manager of the loyalty and referrals platform at Yapo, and I'm here with Sarah Townsend. Sarah, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm the digital experience manager. I think experience, closer. <laughs> digital experience manager at DBF. So I do. We're a small team, so I do a lot of a lot of different things, but try to get those ecom team business goals and our design teams brand vision, uh, you know, in a cohesive place for our um, customers. So. Can you guys hear us or is it like, does it need to be, they can? Okay. Um, so I think you talked a little bit about like, you can't, you can't hear her, you gotta be closer. Like, okay. like here, I think. Like here? <laughs> How about now? Wait, try again. All right, I got a thumbs up from someone in the front row. Okay, nailed yeah. it, nailed it. We got thumbs up around the board. Okay. so. You talked a little bit about digital experience, but I'd love to hear, like, at a brand like DVS, like, what, like, what goes into digital experience and, like, what exactly does that mean? Because I think it means a lot of different things depending on, like, the stage of the company and how big you guys are. Yeah, um, we, we sort of talked about this. Um, DVF has really shifted to being primarily e-commerce in the last few years. So our customers are really meeting the brand online only at this point. Um, so we used to have a lot of brick and mortar stores. Um, you know, in 2019, we had 12 US stores um, and we now have one flagship store here in New York. So the way that we talk to our customers and the way that we get feedback from them is, is pretty much only online. Gotcha, and, and I know we talked about this uh, like in the green room, but what, like, you guys had a massive shift from brick and mortar, you're an older brand, you're like an iconic brand, um, but a massive shift to e-commerce, which I think like most, a lot of brands that have tried to do this, uh, especially historic ones, have pretty much failed, for lack of a better word. So like, I'm curious what, like, what were some of the big challenges, the big shifts that maybe you guys didn't realize you'd have to make to get and become like a, like a, like an e-com first brand, which you guys have succeeded in doing so. Yes, so in 2019, e-commerce was a little over half of our D to C business. And in 2021, it was almost 95%. Um, so we really have shifted. Um, in the last year, we've, we've re-platformed, we've changed our tech stack a lot. We've really um, tried to create a more functional digital experience, make it easier, faster, more convenient to shop online. Um, but I think we still want to put the customer first. I mean, we're, we're a 50 year old brand and Diane started in the 70s by, by going <laughs> to the stores where they sold her products and selling you know, the dresses in person to people, talking about the fabrication, the fit, the right way to tie your wrap dress. Um, so she really like was thinking of the brand as direct to consumer. It just meant face to face. And now if you wanna hear how Diane thinks you should tie your wrap dress, um, you can see that tutorial on TikTok, so. Yeah, and I, I think we, like, we briefly touched upon this, but as part of the shift, like did the, like, the way you communicate with customers work, the way you acquire customers, because like the economics are totally different, obvious. Like one, you have a way to actually measure it in a way that probably you didn't before, mm -hmm. but like how have those kinds, those kinds of uh, changes like shifted the way you think about the business and, and how you guys market and how you deliver experiences? I mean, I think one of the things that we've found is that we don't feel like our customer data from the past, even 2019, is really indicative of how people are shopping now or in the future. So that feels like a gap that we really have and we're looking for solutions to close that gap. I don't think we have, but we're, we're working on that. So launching our loyalty program in April was, was part of that push to learn more about our customer um, and, and try to get that insight into who they are and how they're shopping and what, what they want from us. Um, and so you did touch upon loyalty and it's obviously very self-serving, but before we go there, I actually, like you said something really interesting about like acquiring younger customers. 
And it's, I mean, I don't have, it's like, I think just talking more about that would be like really interesting because you guys have this history of customers that have shopped with you for 40 years, 50 years. Mm -hmm. So yeah, talk a little bit more like why the younger customers are important to you and how you think about them and how they're just different inherently. Yeah, we have built a lot of brand loyalty organically over the decades. Um, and we have a lot of customers who are really passionate about the brand. Um, but, you know, the cost to acquire customers is always going up. And, you know, if, if those customers, those new customers that we bring in via Facebook, for example, if they only make a purchase once, then that investment is very high. Um, so we're really trying to find ways to get those first time, younger, newer customers to connect with the brand in a way that, you know, some of the, some of our older customers, longtime customers have had years of brand experience to build that loyalty. And we're trying to do it in a much more accelerated online way for them to, to really get a sense of who the company is. And do you think those like those younger customers, like, and I think there's like an obvious answer, but then there's a less obvious. Answer. Like, do you think there's things that are like there's different things that are important to them in part of like their experience and how they interact with you, in order to like actually accelerate them to make them care about you, which is probably hard because we're a generation of people who don't really care about brands. It's like unless it's yeah. very very convenient. Yeah, I mean, I think they're used to shopping online and they're used to having a million options. There are a lot of companies that make printed dresses and there are a lot of companies that make printed dresses that charge less than we do. Um, so it's really how can we communicate the added value of our products when they can't touch the fabric um, or try it on in person, but I think they're also just so much more aware of how many choices there are out there and how easy it is to find those. So I think we have to find a way to like capture their attention faster. Um, and just stay top of mind in general when like the time does come. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, so switching gears to loyalty. And I think it's actually like really interesting that we have you because I think like brands on the luxury spectrum have a lot of challenges with how they like maintain brand um, and tend to be, for lack of a better word, a little bit picky uh, and resistant to change. But that is not the case for you guys. So I'm curious though, like internally, like what were the hesitations before you guys even really got to the point where you were seriously discussing like, bringing on loyalty as part of your brand? Yeah, I think there's a lot of hesitation to kind of introducing discounts um, and in a way like training your customer to expect to get, you know, something for less. Um, and I think that, you know, it, it's really important to everyone in the company that that the brand maintain, I guess, that, that elevated experience for people um, and then also kind of the integrity, the identity of the brand. Um, so when we were looking at our loyalty program, we really decided to make it super branded. Um, it's very much, it's probably the most colorful, enthusiastic expression of our brand that you'll find in one place on that rewards page. So we really really went all out with um, bringing in some of our heritage prints to make like custom icons for all of those tiles. Um, my favorite one is um, for our birthday tile where you get, get some points for sharing your birthday with us and then a discount. Of course, at that time we have, you know, three candles, which is pretty universally recognized symbol for that. But um, our designer actually made the flames are a rotated version of lips, which show up, you know, in our branding for the program all the time. And those lips were taken from a portrait of Diane that appeared on the cover of Interview Magazine in the 70s, like really iconic um, brand history moments. And I, I don't know that our customers notice all of those things, but I think internally the process of making the page feel like a reflection of the brand and not a discount, you know, 
option for people, I think that really helped us build support internally for the program. Yeah, I, I think like a lot, like brand is like obviously like a, it's a thing that everyone talks about and it can mean like a hundred different things to a hundred different people. But I think like a lot of those things that you're talking about, they're like, you're right, the customers don't necessarily notice, but it is subconscious and they do like feel it. And maybe that's like a very intangible way of talking about it. Um, but I think those things like kind of like the consistency of having it be a part of your brand is what makes them feel like it makes like it feel better. Like, I don't know, there's not a better way. It just feels better when you're purchasing, when you're interacting, that everything is like unified. It doesn't feel cheesy. You can avoid all those like discounty things that, that you were talking about. Um, and I know you guys are like newer to loyalty, but I'm curious, like, what were you guys like looking to measure and like get out of it when you when you first kind of brought it on? And also like so far, what have you been like looking at in terms of like how you measure it being a success? Because obviously like three months is not like really that long to, to measure like ROI and customer LTV, but there's a lot of things along the way that you can look at. Yeah, and we're, we just hit the 90-day mark, and so our customers don't shop with us that often. Um, with our product and our price point, like it, it's very normal for a customer to go 90 days between purchases. Um, so it's kind of hard for us to measure, you know, is this increasing the frequency of orders just yet? So we're having to be very patient. Um, but I think we really wanted to have a channel for more engagement um, and then also you know a, a channel that would allow us to kind of incentivize certain behaviors and influence maybe certain trends that we're seeing in our own data that we don't like the direction that they're going um, so you know that that was kind of we were looking at it really as a solution to our own problems, not because all of our competitors were doing it. So. And talk, like, talk a little bit about like the kinds of behaviors that you guys are incentivizing now, and then maybe even some of the behaviors that you think you guys might incentivize in the future. Um, yeah, so I think we, um, you know, frequency and obviously sales, AOV, like those are all, those are all things that we hope will improve. Um, but we also, you know, we want to increase our understanding of our customers. So we, you know, we kind of started on this loyalty track because we used Yapo for reviews and the custom questions that we had in our reviews were really like the most accurate current information we were getting on our customers' age, what kind of occasion they were shopping for, and we kind of realized we needed more ways to be able to speak to our customers about the brand, but then also to get feedback from them. Um, so, you know, we're, we're in incentivizing writing those reviews, um, following us on social. Um, you know, we, we actually offer bonus points for customers who make their first purchase from our matching sets collection, because we're really primarily known for dresses. But you know we have products in a lot of other categories, so kind of incentivizing customers to maybe try a different product from us than they typically buy. Gotcha. And I think there was another thing that we talked about around like access, like and how now we're talking about incentivizing, but like rewarding and like how you know as opposed to discounting or like that messaging like what's worked with for you in terms of like actually seeing like some actions and, and reward from customers yeah so um, I think we you know we wanted to make sure that people felt like they were getting the best of the brand experience and so we offer early access to shop new collections we offer early access to sales um, and we actually in June we had um, a really limited edition collection we reissued two pieces from um, 1974. Um, and it, it was kind of a big secret, you know, project that we worked on. And so two days before the public launch, we sent out a teaser email. We didn't tell people what it was. We just said, you know, something big is coming. DDF insiders are gonna get the first look. Sign up today and check your inboxes tomorrow. Um, and on that day that we sent out that teaser, for the US, we had 364 people create an account. And for reference, the day before, we had 10. 
So, uh, you know, I think Big change. Yeah, the, the, um, the access is something that we, that our customers want. Um, and, you know, we want to make sure that, like, our loyal customers feel that we appreciate them because we do. Um, so I think, you know, we, that, that was part of the, the selling a loyalty program internally, too, was we want to make sure that we treat our loyal customers as well or better as our new customers um, in terms of, you know, acquisition and incentivizing that first purchase. We want to make sure that repeat purchases are, are just as appreciated. And you guys had like a, like you, maybe this is inside baseball, but you guys had a VIP like list of customers that you'd had for years, right? Yes. <laughs> I don't know where it came from. I don't know who it made it. I don't know what the criteria were, but when I started, we had a VIP email list and we, we used to send them early access to sales and it just didn't work. Whoever was on that list was not really our top customer anymore. Um, so I think <laughs> well, that, that was an indication that the information that we had was really outdated and we needed some other way to identify our top customers and then be able to reach them easily. So you're saying it could have just been like someone who looked rich who came into a store like 15 years ago? It could have been, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I just know that when we, when we sent to that VIP list, we didn't really see a lot of engagement or sales. So um, something had happened between when they made it onto that list and now, um, and it, you know, I think that that was just our feeling is our customer data was not current. And like, like, what are you guys looking to, like, we talked a little bit about this, like, what are you looking to get out of, like, data from your customers? What are you looking to learn, uh, both from, like, historically what's worked and what's working now as you have, like, a big shift in, in channel? Yeah, I mean, I think we know the basics. We know our customer is a woman. We know that she has probably has a fairly high income just because of our price point and our product offering. So we're really trying to understand what occasion she's shopping for. You know, I think we used to have a, a really strong contingent of people who shopped the brand for work, um, but most people aren't going into the office five days a week anymore. So is that, is that customer still with us? Um, do they still buy for that or do they want something else? Um, you know, how, how many people of our customers are buying for special occasions? Um, you know, buying because it's travel friendly. Um, I think we, we just want to understand, um, I mean, I guess demographics, age, age range as well. We know our customer's a little bit older. We'd love to get a newer customer engaged with the brand. Um, and we're, you know, trying to figure out to see if, if that's working. So it's really like, it's, it's trying to understand not just like the demographics, because whether that's easy or hard is a different point, but those are like stagnant things. It's like who they are, why they want to buy your products, and how they're going to use them. Yeah. Um, I think because we have a really long brand history, we've had a lot of different iterations of the brand. We've had a lot of trends in the products that we offer. Um, and you know, that, that's kind of changing. So our, who the DVF woman is, is kind of, has always been fluctuating and we want to understand who she is now. Um, okay, and I know like C just gave me the ax because we got like a minute, but um, what do you think like, I guess like the parting thought, like what do you think is the biggest challenge in terms of like creating experience, which is what you do for luxury customers in like the modern e-com world? Like, you don't know, like biggest challenges and biggest like, like, like the gap between the challenges and like your ideal state of like where you want to go. I mean, I think for us, like we have a lot of editorial content on our website. We have some brand history. We do interviews with you know, really amazing women. Um, we have a lot of sort of extra branded stuff, um, but I think we're struggling to get people to really engage with that. So it's there, we're creating it. You know, we feel like it's really unique content, but 
people, you know, it seems like people are just shopping us the way, you know, that they would shop any brand. And I think we want it to feel unique to DVF and how do we get them to engage with some of the aspects of the brand that are beyond just the single product that they're looking at. Got it. Awesome. Well, thank you for your thoughts. We're out of time. Sarah Townsend, everyone. Thank you.